A leader has to take the risks. Mr. John, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? All right. Fantastic. Excited to meet you. Heard lots about you. Read lots about you. Uh, Watched 45 million uh, Instagram videos on you. So it's mm -hmm. like there's nothing better, man. We got the, the we got the storyteller expert yes. extraordinaire with us today on Wealth on the Beach. So excited, man. And you're living your life with the white shirt and the tan skin and the white teeth. It's all on brand, Daniel. You look great. Well, you know, it's uh, life is is pretty darn good. But hey, John, uh, John Livesey uh, is an expert uh, storyteller. I mean, keynote speaker. Has spoke and and been involved with Forbes and Entrepreneur and Inc. and Fast Company, ABC, CBS, Fox, Yahoo, NBC, Adweek, Fortune. Unbelievable. I mean, everybody's saying a mate, Berch, Berkshire Hathaway says beautiful things about you. Olympus, uh, Olympus says beautiful things about you. So you've been everywhere. Okay, first, I just want to start off by uh, saying, uh, wh where's your favorite place that you've been in all of these travels, man? Because I know you've been everywhere. Oh, well, the most recent place that comes to mind is I was hired to speak for a software sustainability platform company in Ottawa, Canada. And I live in Austin. So I got to fly from the capital of Austin to the capital of Canada. And it was in January. And, you know, I had to change planes in Toronto. So I'm like, I'm going a day early. There's too many potential delays and canceled flights with storms. And a Canadian friend of mine said, oh, while you're there in Ottawa, you should go to this amazing spa that's half outside, half inside. And they had this dry salt water pool where you made a reservation and you floated like you're in the dead sea it was incredible so that's one of the that's the most recent place that pops up into my head exciting man exciting all over the world um uh in, impacting so many uh audiences everywhere and you know one of the cool things about me watching all your videos i mean i've been in sales for 25 years but uh one of the cool things is i love people that tell great stories. And so mm. I, it, it, I was just, it was amazing. I'm sitting there watching video after video, after video, after video, because I'm like engaged in these stories yes. because we, you know, our brains and you were kind of talking, maybe you could talk a little bit about this, but our sure. brains are wired right. to, to, to love stories. How is that? Well, if you go back to the days when mankind lived in caves, they still stories by, you know, the fire and painted them on the walls. Now we tend to tell stories with the glow of PowerPoint presentations in conference rooms, but it is a part of the way our brain goes. If I say it, let me tell you, Daniel, some stats and figures, your brain goes into analytics and left brain analysis, paralysis. But if I said, you know, let me tell you a story, you automatically relax. You think, oh, there's a different part of my brain now. Maybe it'll be in entertaining even. Um, and if it's a great story, it'll be memorable so that people can repeat it to other people and become your brand ambassador. So I tell people your story should be three C's, clear, concise, and compelling. So we can unpack each of those if you like. Why does it need to be clear? If it's not yeah. clear, we confuse people and we know the confused mind says no, and they're never going to tell you they're confused. Right? Um, why does it need to be concise because you want it to be short enough that people can remember and repeat it. And then finally, why does it need to be compelling? It needs to make us feel something. If the stakes aren't high in the story, we don't care about what's going on. And we have to tug at some heartstrings in order to get that emotional connection that makes people want to buy from us or hire us. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and, uh, and, and so Tell me about your story. I mean, I, I want to know a little bit about where you came from. Where were you born? I mean, oh gosh, were, were you born a rich? <laughs> uh, 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 were you born a rich kid, a poor kid, middle class kid? Were you a was... good boy or a bad boy? <laughs> I want to know your compelling story. Well, I don't know how uh, compelling uh, it is, but uh, my story is: I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, in the um, Midwest, middle class. Uh, life. My dad was a carpenter. My mom was a secretary. 
Um, and it was very much those values of help people, volunteer, work hard. Um, and I knew I wanted to get into advertising. So that's what I majored in in college. And I was completely fascinated by what made people change brands or change their opinion or persuade people. And it had enough show business element to it with music and and, and sound bites and tag lines to make it entertaining for me versus just hardcore business. And then I moved to San Francisco and was selling multi-million dollar mainframe computers against IBM. And they would sell with something called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So if you as the client bought anything that wasn't IBM and it broke, and it broke a lot in those days, they'd point the finger at the other vendor and say, you know, that person brought that other vendor in and you will get fired. And I went, oh, it's not about the logic. This equipment's less expensive. It's more reliable. But there's all this emotion behind still not buying something logically. So that's really when the advertising background kicked in. And uh, then I got transferred down to LA and ended up working for an ad agency doing commercials for movies coming out on home video. If you remember that, you may not be old enough to remember Blockbuster, but uh, that used to be on every street corner like Starbucks. And I really honed my storytelling skills there because if a movie hadn't done well in the theaters, we could reposition that commercial to get people to want to go rent or eventually buy it. And so it's just, well, how, what part of that 30 second story are you telling out of the two hour movie? And then I had a 15 year career at Condé Nast selling advertising for brands like W magazine and self and Condé Nast has big brands like wired and GQ. Um, and Lexus was one of my territory when I lived in LA and they said, you know, we looked at, I don't know, 25 magazines. We picked 10 to come in and pitch back to back. Um, and we're only going to pick three, but do not talk about numbers because we've already analyzed that. That's why you're in the final 10 and half of the reps were deer in headlights. Well, I can't talk about my circulation and my reader's income. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. So that's when I realized, oh, whoever tells the best story is the one that's going to get the sale. And then from there, I started speaking to my clients' sales teams, whether it was a car company or a fashion company. And that's what launched my speaking career. And so when you were, can, can you tell me a little bit about that story? I mean, that you told Lexus that kind oh, of sure. got you, like what, what was it on your story versus yeah. maybe some of these other stories that, that got you in there where, where the other ones didn't? Well, typically what you would do is you'd have a marketing idea to go with your presentation. And so that was really what the story was that this particular idea is going to engage people emotionally because that you always goes back to what's the client's problem or challenge and in the case of lexus i think it's still a challenge for them people don't buy a lexus emotionally they buy a bmw for the thrill of driving but a lexus is like the smart intellectual oh, it'll be a good car kind of thing and they wanted some emotion so if you could come up with an idea that had some emotion and excitement to it and um they said we'd love to target the world of art, because that makes people feel something when you look at paintings and sculptures and um, maybe think of the cars, even moving art, you know, who knows? So we came up with the idea that we would pick up 10 couples who were subscribers and had a Mercedes or BMW lease expiring in six months. So it was very targeted and pick them up in a new Lexus, take them to this Golden Globes party the magazine was hosting. So it was very glamorous. And then from there, they'd go to a, a restaurant with a private dining room where somebody from the Museum of Modern Art would be curating the conversation. And in between courses, they could take a ride in yet another car around the block. So um, they gave me $500,000 worth of advertising. They sold three cars that night, uh, including one of the chef himself bought one. So you never know where the sales going to come from. So that's an example of storytelling, bringing um, data to life. So you, I mean, and I, I'm imagining that this is a little bit different for advertising agency for a guy coming from advertising, then goes on the big stage. And mm. now you just, you built a, a, a you know, a, an incredible career speaking all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, when did you know that maybe you wanted to go into that area versus ah. just staying in the advertising business, just like 
there's a, probably a bunch of your buddies that are still advertised, you know, in the advertising business. Well, I wrote my first book while I was still working at Condé Nast. And that concept of being an entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur, but was very new back then. But luckily, I had a wonderful boss, Alice Alston, uh, who had launched Oprah's magazine. So she was very supportive when I wrote the book and said, oh, we'll throw a book party for you. And then I would go to the um, car advertisers and say, you know, run your car ad in this magazine. They can afford the car. They'll put it on their short list of test drives. And as added value, the magazine would buy copies of my book. And I'm going to give your sales team a talk on how to sell to the luxury market. So the ad drives traffic to the dealerships, and then my book and talk would help close more sales. And when I started doing that, I realized, oh, I love this. And I've been in their shoes. I know what it's like to get rejected. I know what it's like to have pressure to hit quotas. And that's what launched my speaking career. Beautiful. And, and uh, so we're, I mean, look, in, in the, I mean, we're obviously next year we're going into a political, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, another, another an election, another crazy American election we're going to have, I'm sure. How does, I mean, when, when the politicians, I mean, cause these people are, they're taught how to talk. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're tested and, and, and they, yep. you know, like, how does this play a part? I'm just curious from mm -hmm. the standpoint where you come from, because you're a storyteller. And I notice a lot of politicians, they, they're starting to interject little stories into, yes. so how does, how does storytelling play a part in, in, in the political process? Well, they get heavily coached and, and practice role-playing those debates so that they're not a deer in headlights. And so that translates directly to sales. I tell people, don't just go into a presentation cold. You need to practice what you're going to say. Even if you've said it a hundred times, it still needs to be customized to who you're talking to. And also what I see a lot of politicians doing correctly is telling the story of one person. There was this person, he was the plumber, he had a family, he and his wife were struggling, you know, and so that's who these policies are going to help. And the whole goal of a good story is that people see themselves in that story. And so people could remember the name of the person they were talking about. And as opposed to just talking about there's X thousands of people unemployed or unemployment's went up or down or whatever the numbers are, that doesn't stick. It's the story of one person's struggle and how you're going to help that one person's life get better and live the American dream and tag into the heartstrings there. And so some of the all time best, I mean, and, and I'm not asking you for your political leanings, but I mean, as far as like presidents that have done a great job at mm. storytelling yep. and presidents that have not done a great job storytelling, what would you, what would you, uh, how would you um, talk about that? Well, I come from the Chicago suburbs, as I mentioned. So I believe Abraham Lincoln was a phenomenal storyteller. We all know that story of honest Abe and walking to return something and all of that. And that's what stories do. They show you instead of tell you. Instead of saying someone's honest, you show it in a story. And again, whether you like Bill Clinton or not, he was pretty well known for being a good storyteller and a great listener. And his famous line of, I feel your pain. That's my impersonation of a Southern accent. Um, that's a really good characteristic to have as a salesperson is showing empathy for that. Um, and if you think of Elizabeth Warren, Saturday Night Live did a really big spoof on her. Like, I got a lot of plans. I got a lot of plan for this and a plan for that and an option for this and overwhelm people. Too many ideas and not one clear, concise, compelling message, in my opinion. And, uh, uh, and so, I mean, when you look at your life, I mean, obviously your life has changed over the last several years because you started to embrace social media mm -hmm. and you're embracing it a lot. And so the, the good, the bad, the ugly, what, what are people doing right on social media? What are people doing wrong mm -hmm. on social media? Any tips? Because your sure. audience you're talking to right now, John, is a lot of small business owners, a lot of people that are, are, are salespeople. I mean, most people that are watching or listening to this right now, mm -hmm. they are salespeople. I mean, sure. they make their living on commission yep. and they are trying, they're trying to recruit people. They are trying mm. to, to uh, wow. sell people. They're trying to get people influenced to their way of thinking. And right. so- 
you've been you've been on social media and you you watch it. I'm sure you consume a little bit of it. Yeah, and yeah. you're seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, give your thoughts on that. Well, I think your social media should be authentic to who you are. And if you're just a one person company, that don't pretend to be a big multi billion dollar company. Um, and I think the more you are vulnerable in social media, and I'm certainly vulnerable when I give talks, the more people can relate to you. Listen, I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night and not know how you're going to make payroll or whatever the challenge is that you're solving. Uh, I think that if you make social media entertaining with humor, some music sometimes, little graphics, you can also create open loops in your social media. So in storytelling, an open loop is, oh, um, when people introduce me at a keynote talk, um, they'll say, John Livesey met Michael Phelps, and he's going to tell us about what lessons he learned when he met Michael Phelps. So that's an open loop that gets started at the, before I even get on stage. So in social media, we can say, you, maybe you have a three-minute story, cut the story down to three one-minute segments and create an open loop at the end of that one. Find out what happens next tomorrow's post. And then you, you know, they do that on TV all the time, right? On the next episode of Grey's Anatomy or whatever it is. Um, so open loops are a great tool to use in social media to keep people engaged and want to come back. And do you think it, it it's a powerful tool that's really helping people? Or do you think that it's a waste of time? Oh, well, I don't think it's a waste of time. I've had many people say they've heard me on a podcast like this one and want to hire me as a speaker. I've had people say, Oh, we watched your videos on LinkedIn or Instagram and want to bring you in. Um, again, it's knowing where's your audience. Is your audience on TikTok or are they on LinkedIn? And really targeting which social, I don't think you should try to be on every social platform. That's freaking exhausting and not targeted. Um, I think the biggest mistake everybody makes is letting your self-esteem go up and down based on comments or likes. You can't be attached to that. If you feel it's a good piece of content, even if you didn't hit X number of, let go of the expectations of worrying about what other people think about you. And, you know, know that you're going to get people that will criticize you. So you got to, you know, that there's a tall poppy syndrome. Do you know what that means? Have you heard that concept? No. So no. poppies typically all grow the same height, but if one takes to grow high, then somebody goes, oh, that's the one we're going to cut down. And so when you put yourself out there on social media, People go, who the heck do you think you are, right? And you can get some anonymous comments or, you know, I had somebody say to me on one of my posts, that suit doesn't fit very well. I know, dude. I still felt that the con, I'm not being hired to be an underwear model. I felt the content was good. I gained some weight during the pandemic. Forgive me, right? So you have to really put up a little bit of a, a barrier to not take those comments personally and not try to please everybody. Yeah, I, I think you look great, bro. So you're doing good. Thank I you. think the suit looked just fine. But but it, it's 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 interesting because I was just I, I do a coaching program every Wednesday morning, and mm -hmm. I was actually talking to everybody uh, today, and I and I said the same thing. I said I've I've had more people say bad things about me in the last 25 years of me being in business. Uh, I've had more people hate information, you know, hate comments you know, bad information. I mean, I'm terrible. They hate me. They don't like me. Uh, I've had people cancel appointments on me. I've been stood up on appointments. I, I've had every possible scenario. I told everybody this morning, I'm like, I've had more of that than all of you guys combined. And I'm I still told standing. <laughs> and I'm still standing. I said, I've never died. I've never died. I've never yeah. gone to an appointment and died. I've never done mm -hmm. a, a social media post and yeah. died. <laughs> and every time, and I think, and this is why I think I've always been pretty mentally tough because, because mm. I've been willing to put myself out there, been willing to do things that, that, that some people might say is bad. And, and maybe it's just because I'm trying something new, maybe mm -hmm. because I'm just, I'm, I'm experimenting or, or I'm just, right. Uh, or I'm just maybe sometimes I just want to be controversial. I want maybe sometimes I mean, I've had posts on my Instagram where I knew going in 
it was going to get a lot of hate. It was getting a lot of, you know, discussion, you know, where there's 50% of people on every discussion, right? There's 50% that totally sure. believe in what you're saying. And there's 50% that thinks yeah. you're a total asshole, right? I mean, so it doesn't matter what it is. You're yeah. always going to get criticized and especially when you're doing good, you know, when you're on stage and you look good and you're, and you're a great, uh, speaker, by the way. I mean, you're Thank an you. amazing yeah. speaker and I love, I love the tone of your voice. I love mm -hmm. just the, the, the clarity of the way you speak. And I just was very, very impressed with that. Oh, and so, so some people watching that, John, they will look at it and then they'll look in the mirror and they'll go, I suck at that shit. Right. So they <laughs> got to find something wrong with you to right. kind of, like you said, the poppy seed, right. To just bring you down, you know, it's kind of like those those relatives that you start doing good. And then the relative yep. goes, Oh, who do you think you are? Are you a millionaire yet? Ever had yeah. that happen? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, I tell people, unless you're the president of the United States, we all get stuck in traffic and we all have red lights, right? Whether you're in an Uber or you're driving your own car. Um, and nobody that I know really takes that personally. You like, you don't go, Oh, I can't believe I hit a red light. It's just part of life. And yet when we hit those red lights in our sales career and people go, oh, it's a no, or as you said, a no show or whatever the disrespect might be beyond that. Um, we don't take that. We can take that personally. But so my goal is to get people to go, it's just a red light, like in traffic. And so don't take those red lights in your business personally. And I think one of the tools I've come up with that I have found helps a lot of people, myself included, is what I call the 555 method. So you think of yourself like the movie director of your own life and you zoom out and you say, somebody cut me off in traffic. I've seen people lose their mind over this. Talk about taking something personally. Uh, you ask yourself, will this matter in five minutes? How about five hours? How about five days from now? And man, if you're still obsessed about somebody cutting you off in traffic five days from now, you are not living a happy life. Um, and so when we work on a big proposal and we get the note, and I've had teams that I've worked with say, okay, we're going to five, five, five this. We're going to let ourselves complain about this for the next five hours. And then we're never going to talk about it again because we have to be completely resilient and let go of that stuff. Cause you can still find yourself talking about it two or three weeks later. I can't believe that person didn't do it. That person hurt my feelings. And you just keep reliving it over and over and over again. So um, I wish I had this tool when my dad had died 10 years ago, because I thought, even now I would be like, well, yeah, five days from now, I was still pretty devastated, but you could do a five, five again. How about five weeks, five months, five years from now? And I thought, oh, so if I could go back in time to my younger self, I'd say, you know, five years from now, you're still going to miss him, but I promise you, you won't be this sad. And so the five, five, five can help a lot of us in personal and person and professional, let go of things, get back up faster. And that's really the key is letting stuff go. Yeah, I mean, I, I relate to that. I, I've always called it compartmentalization for me. It mm. was it was just me putting all these little areas of my life in a little box, right? You know, when I'm focused on my business, I'm focused on my business. When I'm focused on my kids, I'm focused yeah. on my kids, you know, and and I've gone through some challenges. I've gone through a, a, a separation. And, and of course, uh, you've been through a uh, situation divorced. as well. Yep. You, you got divorced. Yep. Same, same here. And so I I've kind of like, you know, every, and, and I could have devastated my life on all these little areas of my life that have gone bad and, you know, challenges that I've had over the last, you know, my entire life, or I could have said, I'm just going to stick it in a little box. If I want to go cry, I'll go cry for a little while in, in, in the, in the closet, you know, and I'll just do my time over there and just take care of it, handle it, you know, process it, deal with it. Yeah. But when I, when I get out of that closet, when I'm out in the world and I go, all right, now I'm going to go out there and yeah. I'm going to be everything that I'm supposed to be in all the other areas of my life. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's, what's kind of helped me. And that, that reminds me of what you're mm. talking about. Well, it's the story we tell ourselves. I'm a loser. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. Whatever your th thoughts are judgment on yourself, you bring that to anyone you interact with. And so if you can forgive yourself, let go of your judgments and you go, yeah, I got divorced. It wasn't fun, but 
I'm not beating myself up about it. And I'm not labeling myself. Even when I go to a doctor's office for the first time, because I recently moved to Austin and you get all new doctors and they have you fill out this form, single, married, divorced, widowed. I'm like, it's none of your business. If I'm divorced, why do I have to check off the divorce box? Right, I'm single. That's all you need to know. Um, so, the, you know, it's fascinating how society likes to label us. But again, we're a choice. We're the movie director of our own life. We, you know, me going in for an eye exam has nothing to do with whether I'm divorced or not. You don't need to know that. Um, so I, I think that's the message for people is you decide what your self-talk is and how long you're going to beat yourself up about something. And also don't let other people label you either. Believe it, believe it, man. And, and so how did you get this? I mean, obviously you have an incredible mindset. You have an incredible, I mean, did you read a lot of books? Did you do a lot of self-improvement? I mean, did you have like a, a specific mentor that you could look back? Because I know I have a specific mentor that really yes. helped me in my life. Is yeah. there somebody that you could go back and go, man, this guy or this gal yeah. really influenced me the most, at least so far in my life? Yeah, the gentleman named Tim Sanders, who's also a speaker, has written several great books. Um, one's called Deal Storming, uh, instead of Brainstorming, about collaboration in the workplace. When I wrote my first book all of those years ago, I had reached out to him because he had written a wonderful book called Love is the Killer App. And I just loved the book. And he always encouraged people to read books and share that knowledge with others. And um, we became friends. And he agreed to write the foreword to my first book. And that was life-changing for me because somebody who I really respected and had aspirations of getting to that level in my speaking career agreed that what I was writing about was worthy of his time and attention. And you know, the words he wrote in the foreword, I thought to myself, oh, if only I could write this well. He said, this book is a walk through John Livesey's mind. I suggest you wear comfortable shoes. So, uh, and we're still friends to this day. So, what a cool way to say that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hope you live in comfortable suits. Okay, so writing. Okay, so I, I want to get your take on this because obviously this is like the, the future of the world. Here is Chat oh, GBT and yeah. AI, and because. The truth is, I mean, I use it for some of my Instagram captions. Now I go back and try to reword them, but I, it helps me kind of yeah. form a nice little, throws in little tips in there, maybe some mm -hmm. emojis or hashtags or whatever. And it'll, it'll, yeah. you know, speed things up for me. But I mean, what's like, what is this going to do for the future of advertising and the future of just writing? I think the, I think Hollywood just went on a writer's strike or something Correct. like that. Well, what, what's, what's happening, man? Well, that rider strike is based on the lack of residuals from streaming channels. Okay. Um, okay. So, it, but it always comes back down to money. We're not getting paid what we should for this. And um, part of the contract I have read is going to make sure that they can't replace riders with AI. You know, because, you know, when you're at, a, I don't know if you've ever been to a taping of a sitcom, but I was able to go when I lived in LA and they write it and they rehearse and then they record it uh, in front of a live audience. And if a joke doesn't work, they pause and then the writers and producers all huddle and come up with another joke. And then they give it to the actors and they have to do it on the spot. Now imagine if they said, Oh, we're not, we're not, let's have chat GPT write those jokes and see, you know, and figure out which one's going to land that then the writers are out of business. So the whole thing of artificial intelligence is so much bigger than just chat GPT and writing. But I think it's always going to require someone to determine, did this make me feel anything? And that's my criteria when I read or write anything. And, and where do you see the world 10 years from now when we're talking about AI? I mean, kind of like what's your, what's your prediction of what's going to happen? And mm -hmm. do you think it's a good thing or do you think it's a negative thing? Well, I know there's been a lot of requests from the industry. Like, could we just put this on hold? Do we figure it out a little bit more? Or what the ramifications are going to be? Um, 10 years, it used to be we could project things out that far. But I remember when the iPad came out and how revolutionary that was. And um, now the new Apple uh, Vision, you know, goggles. And I thought, I don't think we can imagine what 
our life will be like. I mean, Hollywood tries to do it sometimes when they project, you know, in the future, we won't be have, you know, everything will be. I, I just, the one thing that I do predict is that storytelling and the need for human connection will never go away. It may be different forms. Um, we might choose to watch a movie with those VR goggles on on an airplane to make it more immersive and quiet out the airplane sounds. Um, but I'm never somebody, I mean, I go back to the Einstein quote. The biggest decision we all make is whether we think the world is a safe, friendly place or not. And once you make that decision, then you start looking for evidence to support your decision and your belief. And so I'm not someone who gets afraid of the future, afraid of change. Um, I don't play out worst case scenarios usually in my life. I don't think that serves a purpose. Um, I so, But I think, you know, that's a whole other lane of expertise that I personally, um, I'm not an AI expert, but as long, uh, anything that can help people tap, get jump started on their creativity, as long as it doesn't replace it. But I don't want people to go, well, I never have to write another thing again. I never have to have a feeling. I never have to think about really what I'm trying to say here. I'll just let, you know, if I was, uh, had children in school and they were saying, I'm going to write my paper with chat GPT, I think I'd have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. You're not learning anything. And they're like, well, maybe I don't need to learn, but you know, kids not learning how to write cursive or read a clock. I mean, there's a lot of things that I had to learn that they're not learning now. And I'm like, so you basically don't know how to sign your name. It's printed. Okay. I guess that's, you know, uh, well, I don't know. Again, I don't judge whether that's good or bad. I do know that the pandemic was really hard on my friends' kids. The lack of socialization, lack of the prom, or the you know falling behind in school. So I don't think technology is a replacement for learning. I, I think you're right on. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, I I think that me personally, I think this is a great thing. The the you know I I think in. 10 years, if I was to predict, because I do study this stuff a lot, if I was to predict, I mean, things are going to be so much different in the future. I mean, technology is not only has taken over our life this last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, but I mean, I just, I, I mean, it's going to be amazing in the future. I think we're going to live longer. I think we're going to learn things. I think in a way the, the chat GBT thing and the AI thing I think people are going to learn faster, quicker, and better. And I'll give you an example. I'm actually writing my second book, uh, and what what it's helped, where it's helped me a lot lately, is to, uh, like you said, jumpstart some ideas, mm -hmm. but also in the research. Mm. So, for example, I, I've been able to ask it to give me uh, stories of people that are less well known, you know, because we always want to try to find stories of, sure. you know, the famous guy that and we can put up, you know, tell the story because the, the, the books that I'm going to be writing in the future are going to have a lot of stories of successful people, not just mm -hmm. an autobiography of me, you know, 10 times, yeah. it's going to be a lot of stories about successful people like you, I want to put you in, in, in one of those books. And so people that have had a real impact on the world in, in, in a positive way. And I, and so what it's allowed me to do is it's allowed me to meet really interesting people that I never would have known about. And Google is so, you know, it's just, man, you could get caught up in Google for yeah. days, you know, just trying to scroll and you find, you know, give me a story about somebody. And then you're like there for 10 hours trying to find a story of one person where chat GBT, man, it finds a story, tells you about the person. And then from there, you'll rewrite your own version of how you see the story to get people to feel something, to see something. And then of course, try to interject your own personality and wit and, you know, maybe add a little humor or something like that to how mm -hmm. you see that story. And so am I, am I on the right path with that? I mean, how yes. do you feel about it? Oh, I, I remember uh, working on a book and the editor was always saying, we need a, uh, you can't just give a statement. We need a personal story or a story of someone else um, to, to bring this to life. And you just, sometimes you think to yourself, Oh my God, I don't have any more stories from my own life anymore. Um, but there are plenty of other people. And I love reading books who tell me stories of people who maybe I knew a little bit about them, but not a lot. I, I'm, 
uh, was just listening about the story of the founder of Zappos and how focused he was on customer service, kind of like the, you know, the Nordstrom story, right? You could, somebody tried to return a tire and they don't even take sell tires and they still gave him a refund or something. Um, <laughs> so this level of customer service and going above and beyond um, and, and turning the call center into not just a cost center, but into a brand place that if you wow people enough and give them this amazing experience and help them with all kinds of advice. So they had a decision during the pandemic of do we lay people off because we're getting less incoming calls. And then somebody who worked there said, or we could just offer to answer other questions, give you travel tips, how to make bread during the pandemic. And so that kind of, you know, a doctor calls going, I can't find a, you know, I looked online, I can't find this equipment I need for the pandemic. And, and they helped him find one and then they donated 50 more. So, you know, you hear those kinds of stories of somebody creating a company and a culture that creates the opportunities for that. Well, that is a story that sticks with me. And that's what I think makes good books. Beautiful. And, and, and so, you know, as, as you're, as we're kind of winding down right now, John, I, I want you to, to maybe think in your mind, a couple of ideas that you can give that small business owner, maybe struggling a little bit right now, that salesperson, maybe struggling mm -hmm. a little bit right now, that's just not, I mean, they're just not making it, you know, just yeah. things are not happening for them. What are maybe one or two or three simple ideas that you can throw their way? And I want you to, you know, be real direct with them. Don't hold any punches. Like if you were okay. their coach, you know, right now right. telling them this is what you got to do. What sort of advice or guidance would you give them? Well, my whole philosophy is that soft skills make you strong. And it's empathy, listening, and storytelling. So the th my biggest piece of advice is spend a week on each one of those three things and get your listening skills up. Um, get your empathy skills up. The better you can describe somebody's problem, the more they think you have their solution. And then finally, learn how to tell a, a case story instead of a case study. So take your testimonials and make sure they're telling a story and not just one or two lines of, oh, we like this company or this was easy to work with or whatever. There's no story there. Or um, a case study tends to be pages and pages of facts and data that no one's going to read. So teaching people how to turn a case study into a case story is going to make you close more sales. Because if you told the right story to the right person at the right time, they see themselves in the story and they want to go on the journey with you. And the biggest mistake people make is they think, oh, I'm going to be a storyteller and make this. You're not the hero of the stories you tell. You're the Sherpa helping somebody climb Mount Everest or Yoda from Star Wars. So figure out your top three avatars, your ideal clients. Let's say you're selling a house. There's the young couple that's getting their first house. There's the couple getting divorced uh, who has to sell the house. And then there's the retired couple downscaling. So we've got three core kinds of people. Have a story of someone just like them that you've helped so that you tell you don't tell the retired couple a story about another young couple, right? It's very customized. And that they go, oh, well, you helped another old retired couple. It sounds like what we're going through. You're, you're the perfect person to help us sell this house. So you're basically what you're saying is that we have to actually practice before we go yes. see our clients. We actually, we actually yeah. have to think about stuff before we go see a client. Yeah. We can't just show up. I mean, we got to practice, trill, rehearse, kind of put together little stories, make sure that our client, I mean, th th this always made me crazy, especially when I was, you know, I mean, on, on appointments, either I went on or I'd watch yeah. one of my agents go on and I would, I would see them do a presentation. I'm going like, where did you learn that? Like that has nothing to do with what we've been teaching you the entire Ooh. time. Like people yeah. wing it all the time. The difference between the greats and the ones that, yep. that ultimately succeed are the ones that practice drill and they rehearse what they're doing. Yeah. It's very egotistical to think you don't have to practice. If you look at athletes, People on Broadway, they don't, actors on movies, they don't get up in front of the audience or the camera or the stadium without rehearsal and practice. And yet you're like, ah, I don't need to practice this. I'll just wing it. I'll get inspired in the moment. And of course, they don't have three concise points. They wander, you know, they ramble or they completely blow it or their nerves overtake them or they confuse people, you know, and it's all from a sense of 
I don't need to practice. So my favorite quote around that is Arthur Ashe, the famous tennis pro said, the key to success is confidence and the key to confidence is preparation. It's awesome, man. Well, look, uh, John, this has been so much fun and uh, just excited about you being with us today. I know uh, that there are people right now, they are like, they're going, I want to hang out with this guy, John. I want to know who he is. I, I want to watch his YouTube. I want to watch his, his Instagram videos and all this stuff. So how do we get a hold of you? How do we get in touch with you? How do we get your book? How do we sign up for your course? How do we get connected with the great John? <laughs> well, the easiest thing is just go to my website, John Livesey, L-I-V as in Victor, E-S-A-Y.com. That's got the link to the online course and some coaching or having me come speak to your sales team. Um, my book is called The Sale is in the Tale, which is a business fable. So it's literally a story about storytelling. And if you can't remember any of that, just Google the pitch whisperer and all my content comes up from that. And that's my handle on Instagram. Okay. The pitch whisperer. Where'd you come up with that? Well, I was being interviewed by Anthem Insurance. And they were looking at me and another speaker. And I asked them a question, what's going to happen after I give my talk if I'm the one that you hire? Oh, we're going to have an improvisation session. People are going to shout out objections from the audience and people are going to role play being the doctors and anthem on stage. And I said, well, what if I stayed after my talk and would be part of that? Because improvisation is all about yes and. And I could whisper something in their ear to keep it going. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. We never even thought of asking a speaker to do that. You're hired. And at the actual event, it was a big success. And people goes, oh, I wish you could be in my ear all the time. And so when I was being interviewed by Inc. Magazine, they said, wow, you're like the pitch whisperer. And I thought, oh, I like that. And then I had it trademarked. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful. That's cool, man. Very cool, very cool. Well, John, thanks again. I really appreciate all your wisdom and all your thoughts, man. I, I hope we can stay connected and, and yes. continue to be friends. And if you're ever out in Newport Beach, California, make sure you come and say hi. Let's go have lunch or dinner or something cool. And uh, and uh, with that said, everybody that, that's watching, listening, thank you so much for continuing to be a part of Wealth on the Beach podcast. This has been a, uh, I, I think we're on four or five year journey now. It's been so much fun. Interviewed over 250 amazing, beautiful people. And I feel you know, honored and, and grateful and, and just so happy that I get to be in this position to do this. And, uh, and the truth is, is I, I appreciate everybody watching. I appreciate everybody hanging out with me every single week for all of these weeks. And, and, and I hope it's bringing you value. And so always remember to reach out, to comment. If there's something out, you know, if there's somebody you want me to interview or there's some other topic you want me to talk about, there's some other, you know, value that I can bring to the table for you. Make sure you reach out. Uh, I answer all of my DMs on Instagram. I answer all of my comments on YouTube and I want to get to know you. So make sure you comment in the comments, wealth, W-E-A-L, TH and because I want to know who the champions are. I want to know who's hanging out with me every single week. And I want to get to know you and I want to become a, a friend of yours. And so that we can help each other on this journey called uh, life. And, and let's have some fun. Let's, let's do some great things. Let's travel all over the world. I'll be traveling for a little while, but I'm still going to be hanging out, interviewing, doing cool things. And so we're going to have a, a bunch of fun uh, in the future. So with that said, continue to dream bigger, get after it, but most importantly, do it now. God bless you. We'll see you at the top.